coming out this evening. Uh, my name is Father Robert Imbelli. I'm a member of the theology department and also on the committee for the Church in the 21st Century Initiative. And I'd like to just take a minute this evening to situate this evening and this presentation in the wider context of the Church in the 21st Century Initiative. As you know, Father Leahy, in announcing the initiative, identifies three focal areas that we are to be concerned about in these next years. The first area is roles and relationships within the church, between laymen and women, clergy, bishops. The second is sexuality in Catholic teaching and contemporary culture. And the third is living, deepening, and handing on the faith to succeeding generations. It is that third area, living, deepening and handing on the faith to successive generations that tonight's series seeks to address, and hence the overall title of the series, The Adventure of Faith. The series uses as its framework the creed as the identifying symbol of the Christian faith vision. Just by chance, I asked my own uh, class in exploring Catholicism to submit some questions about the Trinity. And uh, here is one question that I thought was appropriate for this evening. Uh, I won't identify the person who submitted it. The opening scene, the question says, of the movie Dogma shows Catholics at Mass reciting the Nicene Creed with little to no emotion at all. During my times at church, I have found this to be an accurate portrayal of the way many Catholics act during the Mass. The Nicene Creed is very powerful and important to religion, but seems to be passed over as just part of the routine involved with the Catholic Mass. Is someone or something to blame? Or is it just that I haven't seen the people who truly feel the power behind the Creed? It's our hope that this week and the next presentation in two weeks will try to convey something of that power behind the creed. The title of tonight's presentation is The Trinity is the Shape of Faith. I would like to thank, before proceeding further, Adam Baker and Grace Simmons, who are on the advisory committee, uh, for all of their work and their commitment to this series. And now I'd like uh, to present briefly Matt Pearson of the class of 2005 to introduce tonight's speaker. Matt. Good evening and welcome to this, the first of several events in this series oriented towards you and I, the students. Uh, tonight we have the, the privilege of hearing from a vibrant speaker, a prolific writer and thinker, a priest from the Brooklyn Diocese originally and a compassionate and engaging lecturer and teacher, Father Himes is a pillar of the BC community. Please join me in a warm welcome for Father Michael Himes. Well, thank you, Matt, and thank you very much to the committee for the invitation to be here with you this evening. You have already seen the miracle of the evening. I got up here in one step. I kept debating, should I walk around and take the stairs? And I decided, by George Himes, youth is not spent totally. And so, up I got in one step. The only problem is I'm too exhausted to talk. Good evening. Um, I'm really delighted to have the opportunity to speak with you about this topic. And I've thought a good deal about how to do it. And I want to begin, before I turn to the Trinity itself, and explain in a moment why I'm going to turn to the Trinity as the center of my comments this evening, I'd like to begin by talking about what the creed is and therefore, importantly, what the creed isn't. And the first thing to notice about the creed is it isn't a list of things we believe. It would be a great mistake to think of the creed as a kind of handy little summary statement of the principal headings of Catholic doctrine or of Christian doctrine. These are the things that mark Christians off from 
other great religious traditions, we believe the following things. It's not, as it were, the table of contents to the catechism. That's not what the creed is. Well, if that's not what it is, what is it? Just before leaving that what it's not for a moment, I should mention there are really two major creeds. We're all familiar with the Nicene Creed because we recite the Nicene Creed often at liturgies, most often on Sundays. Um, and it is the creed for many, many centuries which was thought of as the characteristic creed of the Eastern churches, especially the Greek-speaking churches. The characteristic creed of the Western churches, the Latin church, the Roman rite, was the creed slightly shorter than the Nicene Creed that we call the Apostles' Creed. So really we could take either one as the creed of which we're speaking, but there's some interesting things to notice about them. If you begin by thinking they're a list of the principal headings of Christian faith, well, you'd expect them to have exactly the same list, but in fact they don't. For example, the Nicene Creed tells us very explicitly and very insistently about the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, and that the Father, with the Father and Son he is worshipped and glorified. And it goes on to tell us that he spoke through the prophets, presumably not only the inspired teachers of the first Christian generation, but also the prophets of the Hebrew scriptures, of the what we used to call Old Testament, that it was the spirit who inspired Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and, uh, and uh, all of the prophets of the scriptures. Well, that's a very interesting thing to know, and the Apostles' Creed doesn't say a syllable about it. All the Apostles' Creed says is, and we also believe in the Holy Spirit. Doesn't say anything about the Holy Spirit coming from the Father and the Son. Doesn't say anything about the Holy Spirit being uh, worshipped and glorified equally with the Father and the Son. Doesn't say anything about the Holy Spirit's involvement with the Hebrew Scriptures. By contrast, there are things in the Apostles' Creed that we don't find in the Nicene Creed. One, which I would love to talk about because I think it's one of the most interesting and consistently untalked about clauses in the creed, we find out that after Jesus suffered, died, and was buried, the Apostles' Creed says, and he descended into hell. That's an interesting phrase. And really got a great deal of attention to the Middle Ages. It's fascinating. Nobody ever talks about that today. It was a powerful image for the Middle Ages, Jesus descending into hell and breaking open the gates of hell, the so-called harrowing of hell, as it was spoken of in medieval English circles. Um, Dante re constantly returns to that image throughout the Inferno section of the Divine Comedy. We never hear about that today. You know, I mean, even, even in things like we name parishes after events in the Lord's life. We talk about the Church of the Ascension or the Church of the Resurrection or the Church of the Incarnation. You've never heard a parish called the Church of the Descent into Hell. <laughs> However appropriate it might be in many parishes, uh, it, it is in fact never used. Why is it that it was such a powerful image for our ancestors of the faith? Nobody talks about it much now. So important that the Western, the Latin, the so-called Apostles' Creed, includes it in the Creed, although the Nicene Creed doesn't. It's also interesting that later on, the Apostles' Creed includes the communion of saints. The Nicene Creed doesn't say a word about the communion of saints. And perhaps most startling, I would hope, for contemporary Catholics, is that there's really almost nothing about sacraments. In either creed, only one sacrament is explicitly mentioned. In both of them, we say that we believe in baptism for the forgiveness of sins. But, of course, Catholics would maintain that the central, the primary, the core sacrament, the sacrament to which everything leads up and from which everything flows is the Eucharist. And there isn't a word about the Eucharist in either creed. So if you were to take the creed as a kind of handy-dandy summary of the principal heads of Christian belief, one, it's odd that they don't quite match up, the Eastern and Western creeds, and that both of them leave out some things that we would think are very, very important indeed. So if it's not a summary of the Christian faith, what is it? 
Well, let me take a suggestion from a dear friend and sometime colleague here at BC, Professor Nicholas Lash, very distinguished British Catholic theologian, who in his little book on the creed suggests that the place to begin is with the last word. And of course, if you think about it for a moment, the last word of the creed is amen. Well, what do you usually say amen to? Usually, we think of it as ending a prayer. So that's the first thing to notice about the creed. The creed is a prayer. Well, if it's a prayer, who is it addressed to? Well, like all prayer, it's addressed to God. So the creed isn't something said to us, these are the things you ought to believe. The creed is not said to one another as a kind of mutual pledge of fidelity. Here we are all together and these are the things we all say we believe in. The creed is addressed to God. It's us, both as individuals and together as a community, talking to God. Well, why would you have to tell God what the principal doctrines of Christianity are? God presumably knows. We don't need to remind God of what Christianity is about. So why are we saying this as a prayer? Well, first of all, let me go back to that amen for a moment. What does it mean? It comes, its root is in a Hebrew word, a, Hebrew, a collection of Hebrew words, that means something like true reliable, dependable. But what it actually is saying is, it's a kind of statement of, this we bank on, this we rely on, this we commit ourselves to absolutely. It's a little bit like the phrase, I do. Now, let me give you two uses of I do. Do you, John, take Mary as your lawfully wedded wife? I do. And at a baptism, or for example, at Easter, when we renew our baptismal promises, do you believe in God the Father, the maker of heaven and earth? I do. I suggest to you in both cases, we're using I do in exactly the same way. It's not simply a, yeah, I can go along with that. I mean, this is, uh, certainly the first one isn't. Do you take Mary as your lawfully wedded wife? Well, yes, I guess. <laughs> you know, I mean, here she is. She's, all, she's got this f expensive white dress on, and I've got on, you know, morning clothes. What the heck? I suppose. Yeah, on the hell, I'll assent to that. That's a good description of what we're doing. Yes, I take her as my spouse. It's a statement of commitment. I do. I pledge myself. I'm putting myself on the line. This is something I'm staking my life on. I do. Well, it's exactly in that same sense that one says I do to the baptismal promises, which of course are simply the creed in question form. Do you believe in God the Father, the maker of heaven and earth? I do. I bank on this. It's not simply a case of do you agree that Colombo is the principal, is the uh, capital of Sri Lanka? Let's see, Sri Lanka. How many other cities do I know in Sri Lanka? Uh, no, I don't know any other cities. Uh, it sounds right to me. I do. I'll accept that. It's a statement of commitment. I bank on this. And that's what the creed is. The creed is a statement of commitment to God. This is what before you. Before God, I am banking my life on. That's a very important statement indeed. Now, what shape does it take? Well, the shape is the thing I want to get to. And to understand it, the, f the question we have to ask next, the first question is, what kind of a thing is the creed? And my answer is, it's a prayer. It's an act of worship to God in which we commit ourselves to God. And I'll be back to that notion of its being a prayer in my conclusion. The second question is, well, when did it start? Where did it come from? When did we start using it? Where, how did it originate in the Christian community? And there are oceans of ink spilt on this. 
tremendous amount of very scholarly historical study has been done on how the creeds originate and where the creeds originate and when they originate. But one thing seems to be agreed by everyone, and that is they originate in the baptismal ceremony. It was part of the right by which you introduced people into the Christian community. As you introduced people into the community, they recited a prayer, a statement of commitment and of glory to God. And that statement, whether very elaborate or very short, whether with lots of clauses or just two or three clauses, that statement is the origin of what becomes the creed. So the creed arises in baptism. Once again, I could spend the whole night on this. You will be happy to know I'm not. But I could spend the whole evening on this. Think about the fact that it originates in baptism for just one moment with me. Just one moment. My favorite question for trying to get people to think about baptism is this. Remember what St. Paul in the letter to the Romans says about baptism? He says it as something that everybody, all these early Christians in Rome know. Don't you know, he says to them, and of course the implication is, of course we do. Don't you know that when you were baptized, you died with Christ? You were buried with Christ and have been raised again from the dead with Christ. So if you have died to your old sinful life, you are now raised as a whole new creature and you must live accordingly. Well, we've heard that kind of thing so often, of course, in, our, in the course of our lives as Christian believers, that it may not strike us how strange it is. I mean, would you usually talk about joining a community or an organization in terms of dying and coming to life again? Would you think of joining the Republican or the, or the Democratic Party and think of it, yes, I used to be a Republican, but I've died to the Republican Party, and I am raised again as a Democrat. I mean, we would say, that's a bit much, you know. I, would you join the Elks or the Knights of Columbus and describe it as dying and rising again? It's not the usual language you would think of. Why is it that Paul uses it, and Paul uses it as something that everybody knows? He doesn't think he's making this language up or using it for the first time. Don't you know this? And he presumes the answer is yes. You all heard this before. That in fact, for that early Christian community, to enter into baptism was putting your life on the line. You were changing everything about your life. You were changing your relationship to your family, to your friends, to, your, to, to the empire of which you were a member. You were quite probably going to have to change the way you made a living because there were so many, so, such a long list of occupations that Christians couldn't fulfill because they were so connected to pagan worship. Not just things like working in temples, but being painters or sculptors or actors or producers of plays or butchers or architects or teachers. A long list of things that you couldn't do. So if you were any of those occupations, you're going to have to give them up and start a whole new profession. Literally, it was a case of, and of course, finally, you might end up being martyred. So when you accepted baptism, quite literally, the old you, everything about you to that point in your life, that was over. It was as if you had died and you were starting a whole new life in every way. You've, been, you've come back as a new person. You've been raised as a new creature. Paul bent that very seriously and so did the early Christian community. And it was in that context of radical change. The old me is gone and this is a whole new Himes. It's in that context that people first started reciting creeds. So creeds are enormously crucial statements in which we glorify God and state our commitment. What shape does it take? Well, you know, there's a very old legend. The legend goes back at least into the fourth century. And it, 
it's already been around for a while in the fourth century when we first find it recorded, that the Apostles' Creed is called the Apostles' Creed because it came from the Twelve. And that each one of the Twelve supplied one clause of the Creed. Lovely idea, almost certainly false, but a, uh, it has no historical backing at all, but a lovely idea. Indeed, the thing to notice, the reason I mention it is, some people will look at the Creed and say there are 12 major clauses. And that's how they were able to assign it to the 12 apostles. St. Thomas Aquinas, 